how much I love you. Never know how much I care. Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with veteran and acclaimed jazz singer and songwriter Anne Hampton Calloway. She opened up about her new 2023 album called Fever, a Peggy Lee celebration. This new project highlights the songwriting talents of Peggy Lee, who wrote or co-wrote over 270 songs in her lifetime. Anne comes from an artistic background. Her parents were John Calloway, a legendary TV and radio journalist, and Shirley Calloway, a pianist, performer, and revered voice teacher. She has had a charmed and long existence in jazz. She has great stories and gets into all of it. Enjoy. And thank you for taking a minute out. I'm looking forward to getting into fever and, and your life and music. Before that, you know, we've gone through quite a thing with COVID. I'm curious how you survived that COVID three-year time period now that things are kind of waking up and opening up and how it's changed the way that you approach things now. Well, it was interesting. I was, for some reason, very in touch with us, with what was going to happen. And in February, I wrote to my manager and I said, we need to reinvent everything and I'm going to need to get technical abilities and assistance to do uh, shows from my home. And um, I would like, I was telling my manager, please um, send out a word of what I'm offering to people to keep the celebrations going. So I ended up writing uh, numerous, I don't know, close to 100 songs, uh, commissioned songs to uh, honor people, you know, whether it was for a cause or a birthday or an anniversary, a passing of somebody. Uh, It was very, a very interesting creative time. I wrote a poem every single day starting 2020, not knowing there was going to be a pandemic and then continued that on into 2021 and then I I had the Callaway Hideaway series which was a very popular uh, online series of Zoom concerts that really brought people together and I took requests every month and did a big new show and it was extremely well received and people were very grateful that that you know they could hear my music and get together and they could applaud and they could see each other sometimes on Zoom. And it was um, it was an extremely emotionally challenging time just because it had such a sense of, well, gee, may, maybe we could die from this. We better really, really be careful. And so I started getting very much into the bucket list mentality. And as a result of that, um, I made it a friend who's been very kind to many artists I made her aware that I was hoping to do an album of original songs, and she said, well, why don't you just do it, and I'll pay for it. So it's almost finished, and in September this year, uh, Finding Beauty, which will be my first collection of only Anne Hampton Calloway originals, which I began recording during the pandemic with my friend Trey Henry, who's a a brilliant, multi-Grammy-nominated artist. Um, So we have a, a beautiful project to reveal uh, later this year, and it's it's been a very rich time and a very disturbing time, and you know it's a lot of emotions. But I I was so glad to be an artist because I was at my most creative. But I guess right now I guess that's the, that's the danger sometimes of interviewing artists is that you've moved on to new projects, and this one that um, is specifically on my radar is the Peggy Lee. Right. Well, the Peggy Lee project was very last minute, and it it was the perfect timing, though. I had just done uh, a belated centennial celebration at uh, 54 Below. It was very well received, great rave reviews. And uh, a woman who was the head of of Palmetto Jazz Records wanted me to do a tribute, my tribute to Linda Ronstadt, and I said, you know, I'd I'd really be more interested in doing... Peggy Lee, she has more resonance for me right now. And we just finished the the show. And so we got in the studio and I invited uh, two other artists who weren't in the show, John Pizzarelli and Bob Mann. And boy, did we just put that album together in one day. I, I did some vocal overdubs when needed, but it was pretty much done um, because we were just so into it and we were so infused with it and the arrangements were beautiful, and it was it was really a a very magical experience. So that that is 
that's what I'm talking about right now. But you asked about the pandemic and making singles and recording and writing and putting on live stream shows was a very busy time, actually. How did this jazz journey, this music journey begin for you? How did these seeds get in you? Well, um, I, I call it designer genes. Um, my mother, Shirley Calloway, was a fabulous singer, pianist, and voice teacher. And she performed, uh, she did great American standards, but she also sang with George Schulte and um, Giolini and a b- bunch of great conductors with the Chicago Symphony Chorus. And so she had classical and, um, and you know, the Great American Songbook. Uh, musical threads and when I was a kid I would watch her sit and play the piano and sing and and I just thought I want to do that and and then I just added songwriting to it which kind of came from my dad who was a legendary journalist in Chicago uh, John Calloway who won numerous I don't know may, maybe 16 Emmys and uh, numerous other awards and was a, a real great interviewer writer um journalist uh, in the sense of moderating uh, events and, you know, getting the story in any number of ways. He started out on radio and um, then went to television, and he had a great love of jazz. And so his jazz record collection was what fired my imagination uh, for the music that I do. And, And I've also been open to the wonderful singer-songwriters and people of my childhood who really were making meaningful music. Uh, there was a lot of music that I grew up with around me that I did not respond to at all, and I was very sophisticated for my age and le- was leaning more towards jazz and serious songwriting, etc. So that's kind of where I got my start. So there was almost a part of you where it was in the gene pool. It was kind of predestined based on you know, talented parents. And I mean, did you ever feel as though it was a natural inclination for you to get into the arts and entertainment? Oh, I couldn't imagine doing anything. I mean, I, there are many things in the arts I love. I I wanted to be an actress and, the, and being a good actress really helps you be a good singer because if you can't step into a moment in time and feel as if you're in that moment with all the emotional surprises, you, you don't have as many tools in your arsenal to be a, a great singer. And so I'm glad I have that that background. I'm also, you know, a serious photographer, and I love to paint, and I write many different kinds of of um, writing. I do a lot of improv. So I'm I'm just was born creative. But if if I I couldn't do anything else, I'm so interested in people and healing. I would have probably been a therapist of some sort, but I I wouldn't have nearly as rich, enriched of a life as I have now. So of all the stages that you've had the chance to get on, especially in the beginning, what was the one stage that you played on that you had to pinch yourself? You couldn't believe it was happening. Well, Carnegie Hall is that you knew you made it when kind of stage. And I performed on that stage many times. As a matter of fact, uh, I was asked to be one of the artists in 2003 to celebrate Peggy Lee after she passed. And that's where I met, pardon me, her family and many wonderful artists and there's such a sense of history on that stage, and and when you walk out and you look at that hall, it, it just feels like you've arrived, and it, it's very inspiring. So that that certainly was one of the big ones. And I know when I was opening the Streisand Songbook at Orchestra Hall in Boston with the Boston Pops and Heath Lockhart, and had ninety nine standing ovations, that made me feel that. I had arrived at a certain point in my career where I could command that kind of response uh, with such an esteemed orchestra in a place like that. And so that was another, you know, gorgeous moment. But I also really love performing in intimate jazz clubs and, you know, I'm I'm very enthralled sometimes when I get to sing outside in San Sebastian, Spain, and there's people going, you know, all o- all around you that are just standing watching the, m- the music come out of you. It's it's um it's a pleasure singing in so many different settings. So of all the different facets that go into what you do and being, you know, a musician, what is it that you like the best? 
you know, what is it that really motivates you that's consistently been a testament to your longevity? I'm a spiritually motivated person. I believe that as an artist, I'm called to be a messenger. I'm called to be a person who can bring beauty and truth, comfort, insight, sensuality, um, whatever the moment is asking for. I love just surrendering everything and being present to the moment and getting in front of a beautiful audience and doing what I know how to do with great musicians is not just a joy, but it's an honor. And I love, I love sharing great music with a, with an appreciative audience. Sometimes you have an audience that's a little shy or, or they're not as, you know, they don't express themselves as much. But creating a, uh, an experience where people feel back in touch with themselves, they feel their, um, they feel who they are, they feel what matters to them, they feel a sense of romance or hope, or that they're not alone in, in dealing with dark things, or, or that they feel amused and delighted. I think it's it's really fun to be able to show many facets of, of what we deal with as human beings in a concert and so and and show many facets of who I am so people are they're going to get some serious ballad bondage from me they're going to get a lot of laughs they're going to get a lot of spontaneity they're going to get tenderness they're going to get ferocious divadom <laughs> it's it's always a a fun thing when you just leap into the unknown with great songs and see what happens. I, I, I love the surprise of it all. So let's say you have a dream tonight and you run into the younger version of yourself, say in your 20s, and you could give that version of you a piece of advice based on the wisdom you've gained, the, the life that you've led. What would you tell your young version? I would I would tell my young version of me, don't be discouraged by all of the almost of your career just keep doing what you're doing and have faith that you will have um, a meaningful life. You know, it's, it's, I think there were many people who tried to say, Oh, well, why, what are you doing in a place like this? Why aren't you more famous? You know, when I arrived in the scene, I got so many rave reviews, but it didn't have good luck in many ways. And a lot of the things that happened in my life, took 10 years to happen and each break I got was an incredibly long road and I would just tell that person believe in yourself learn from the best work hard and don't ever feel that it's not going to that your your moment w won't happen because you are meant to be doing this and it's just a matter of time when when the stars align. The one thing you mentioned is you got to learn from the best. And the one thing that's been fortunate about your life and music is that you've been around a lot of legends and luminaries. Yeah. What is it that has really risen to the top that you remember that's resonated in, in, in you that you've learned from the legends and luminaries? Whether it was by osmosis or someone said something to you, what is it that's really rang through your career that you thought about with being around that caliber of talent? Well, it's interesting. There, there are. I'm a real sponge, and I've learned from not only great musicians, but great writers, great artists. I've studied a lot of what makes the best of people. And uh, growing up with a father who did incredible homework, he was so prepared. He, he just... He was, he was never phoning it in. He was set a, a work ethic that was really high. And so that being mentored by my dad in terms of what it takes to, to come up with a real thing, um, that was a great example of, of, uh, good mentoring. I had many wonderful teachers growing up, but in terms of like famous artists and famous people, the people I didn't know, but I listened to, uh, I've spent a lot of my life saying thank you to them by doing records and, and concerts in their honor. Um, they gave me a v musical vocabulary that you know, completely 
lights up my imagination and those those gifts that they gave me the people who came before me like Ella Fitzgerald, Sarah Vaughan, Peggy Lee, etc., etc. Cetera, et cetera. And then artists, singer-songwriters like Joni Mitchell and Stevie Wonder and Carol King, etc. They they showed me what was possible in myself, and they also blazed trails where if they hadn't, maybe it would have been even harder for me to to be me in this musical world. Standing next to Stevie Wonder on a stage and hearing his voice as if it's coming from the middle of the earth, it's almost as if you feel like you've just been blessed by a vibration. You know, that that vibration stays with you forever. Um, jamming with John Faddis and Dizzy Gillespie at the Vanguard one night, <laughs> it's just the sense of um, playfulness and... Uh, awe-inspiring greatness that that you can be who you are at any given moment and if you're true to the moment you can rise up with the greatest legends that was an important moment for me to know that I could just trust myself um, working a little bit with George Shearing the great jazz pianist he was very um, very encouraging to me to, to pursue jazz primarily. He saw that I was doing many kinds of music due to the situation in New York of most of the jazz clubs only hired extremely famous people. So it wasn't like it was a really easy thing when I came on the scene to have a jazz career that was pure jazz. I was working in nightclubs and people in nightclubs wanted all kinds of music and I sang all kinds of music. And I, I loved much of the music that I sang. But George... He he sort of showed me what sublime was. He was able to, through the, the incredible sensitivity and exquisite artistry that he played with, he brought out something in me that was extra special. Um, the great Shirley Horn, she's a person who, whose depth of singing a ballad uh, that has stayed with me and and helped me to go to a deep place when I sing a seriously beautiful ballad. There are so many people I, I can't even begin to to say. You know, working with Barbara Streisand as a songwriter and doing rewrites for her and writing patter for her and having her record my songs and. Uh, She's a very formidable artist, and you, you do not want to displease her. So just that, getting the work ethic to put your ego aside and say, whatever it takes to make this song be what you need, that's, that's a discipline that I've acquired that is, has served me very well uh, over my career. So, Anne, everyone out there has a perception of you, an idea of who they think you are, your family, your friends, your fans, but ultimately you live your life. What's your perception of you? Who do you think you are? I think I am a, I think one of the most important things about me is that love is, is the center of my life. I try to do everything with love as a friend, as a partner, as a family member, as a singer, as a citizen, that I think the fact that everything that I try to do and wh how I choose what I do and how I do it is based on what is the most loving choice? What is the most loving way to look at the situation? What is the most loving way to deliver this song? What is the most loving way to approach a, a performance that can make people feel that, no, the world isn't ending because we're in a pandemic, you know? <laughs> I think that's, I think that's the one thing that is, matters most about everything I do and and this, the reason I'm alive is I, I try to be love through music. And thank you for opening up. This has been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you for giving me some time to talk about the new album and, and the new albums, I should say. And I'm curious for everyone out there that wants to pick it up, where's the best place for them to go and to find out about any live shows or anything going on in your world? Well, I can certainly go to my website, AnnHamptonCalloway.com, and they should get the tour. There's a tour schedule there. 
And um, you can get my album. It's available at Amazon.com, as and you can do, get it in streaming form or in the CD form. Any of my shows, you, I will be there with signed CDs and can personalize those CDs. I'm available on all streaming platforms. And we didn't really get to talk a lot about the new CD, but it is a very, very special uh, creation to celebrate one of America's greatest singers and songwriters. And uh, I'm so happy that it's had unanimous rave reviews. Spotify numbers are just staggering. I'm so excited about it, and I feel really encouraged that I've made something very special. And I'm looking forward to profiling it on my show, and my uh, my engineer for my program has a program called The Neon Beat that's the American Songbook, and I'm going to make sure that he gets it on his show as well, so he'll get some good coverage here in Kansas City. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, and I love what you're doing. I saw some of the other artists that you've been interviewing, and, and it's, a, it's a great series you've got going. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players and vocalists in New York City, Kansas City, and spots all over the globe, giving fans all that jazz. Thanks to Anne for her time, energy, and cool. If you want to hear more interviews, Neon Jazz archived interviews can be found at Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Subscribe to us at YouTube, and for everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. What a lovely way to burn what a lovely way to burn What a lovely way to burn Neon Jazz